All right, we'll go ahead and get started, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for our live Thursday webinar. I'm Leah College, the Director of Real Wealth Realty, and I'm so glad that you joined us for today's webinar. We got a tremendous response um, to this webinar because this is a topic that's been on a lot of people's minds. Uh, we're talking about how to boost your equity. A lot of people uh, don't want to admit this, but the equity they have in their portfolios is slacking off <laughs> and they could be earning uh, potentially a much higher rate of return if they were brave enough to use that equity. Um, but we get the question often, you know, what is the best way to use the equity and how? How do you tap into it? Do you do a 1031 exchange? Is that the only option? Can you cash out refinance? Can you get a HELOC on a rental property? Um, these are questions that SICs are fielding all the time from investors like you who've been buying properties diligently over the years. And so we wanted to take a deep dive on this. So we have invited... Um, the best to come and talk to you guys today on this topic. We're joined today by Richard Ivani with Guaranteed Rate. Hey, Richard. Hey, Leah. How are you? Good. Richard is one of our go-to lenders. I've personally done a lot of business with Richard, as have many of you on the call, I'm sure. Um, Richard is a perfect culture match with Real Wealth. Um, he lives it for sure. You can see he is joining us on the road in his RV, uh, living Real Wealth for sure. Uh, paid for by his real estate investments. So not only is he a mortgage broker, I don't want to spoil too much of your story, Richard. I know you'll elaborate on this, but um, not only are you, um, you know, a mortgage broker by day, you're a race car driver and a real estate investor and just living your best life on the road here most recently. So um, who better to talk to us about how to get our real estate portfolio to truly serve us over the long term and create wealth so that we can live a more meaningful, purposeful life, doing more of the stuff we enjoy, like like Richard's doing. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining us. If you're live here on the presentation, uh, pop open your questions panel. We'd love to interact with you. Richard's brought a great presentation today, but I will, I'm happy to field some of the questions and, and pose them for him. Um, if you advance to the next slide for me, Richard, I'll take care of a couple housekeeping items and then we'll jump right in. All right, we've got the rest of your August, your Thursdays in August booked here at Real Wealth. So next Thursday, August 15th, we're going to be talking to our Indianapolis team. That's a great cash flowing market. They've got some good rehabs and new construction multifamily. Thursday, August 22nd, we're going to be joined by our San Antonio, Texas team. This has been a very popular team at Real Wealth. San Antonio is a hot market, and this team also specializes in new construction multifamily. Uh, Tuesday, August 27th, for those of you who are new to Real Wealth, we're going to host another new member orientation. So you can get familiar with what we do here, uh, find out how to use all the resources that we put together on our site, and make the most of your free membership at Real Wealth. Um, and then the last Thursday of August, this is another great education class. We're going to talk about how to double your real estate portfolio every three to five years. We're going to get some insights from an investor who grew a $40 million portfolio, portfolio in less than 10 years. Um, so we have a lot to learn from that guest. Be sure that you register for that webinar and, and any of these webinars that interest you. You can click or take a photo of that QR code there to get to the registration page um, and we'll get a registration link to, sent to you. Um, go ahead and register for the ones that you want the replay for. You might not know this, but if you register, we'll send you the replay, whether you were on it or not. So um, register for all of them and, and get the replays emailed to your inbox. Okay, so Richard and I are going to jump into some really interesting strategies today, some hypothetical uh, scenarios of tapping into equity. Uh, but I want to be sure you know that some of these strategies might not be appropriate for you in your specific situation. It's really, really important that you crunch the numbers of a specific deal that you're considering for yourself. Um, this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. There's lots of different ways to do this. So keep that in mind as we're going through these scenarios. Um, past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Purch real estate purchases are subject to investment risks, of course. Um, so you've got to be prepared for that. Definitely consult with your own team to make sure that you're making the best choices for, for you. All right, Richard. Let's jump in. So uh, as I mentioned, I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that we reached out to you on this topic. Uh, you actually helped me personally do a, a cash out refinance on a property of mine uh, that had appreciated quite nicely in a very short period of time. It was cash flowing really well, but I just had this feeling like, you know, I feel like I could probably use that equity somewhere else. And you helped me do a cash out refinance of one and then the subsequent uh, loan on actually a short term rental that I bought with that cash. Um, and so firsthand, you know, you, you and I have had a lot of discussions on this topic. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's why I, I knew you'd be great for this. Um, start off though by telling everybody about you because you have an extremely interesting life. I'm always um, I'm always eager to find out where in the country I'm getting you and what what you've been up to. Absolutely. Well, I'm in Pennsylvania right now. I know it looks really lush and green behind me, but don't be fooled. I am at a truck stop uh, tucked up in a far corner um, on my way to New Jersey. Um, and yeah, I've been on the road for, for over three months. Haven't been home. I have my wife and baby with me. And, uh, you know, as soon as our racing season starts, which is the end of April through uh, the end of August, we essentially pack everything up and, and hit the road. And, I, you know, what's what's really been amazing about that this year is having the opportunity to go and visit all our properties across the country, visit our markets. Um, we actually had the opportunity of stopping by the Indianapolis team a month and a half ago. And then, you know, we spent a couple of weeks in Oklahoma and, you know, it's, it's really cool because, you know, in addition to having obviously these relationships across the country, being able to go park my RV on the construction site, right. And get that level of, understanding of, of, you know, the commitment to excellence, all of, you know, your markets have and all the builders have, and, um, and then also picking out properties, you know, and, and what was awesome is when you reached out to me two weeks ago about um, the opportunity to do this, this webinar, if you remember, I was like, you know what, the timing's perfect, because I'm actually doing one right now, I'm in process of going through the diligence, and um, it's interesting, in, in doing all the preparation for this, it really made me question my strategy until now. And, you know, I consider myself, as we've discussed, more of a conservative investor. I've been investing in real estate for 16, 17 years now, and I've never really cash out refied, never done the 1031. I've never pulled out a HELOC. And, you know, I've, I've been able to purchase a couple dozen properties, but, you know, I've always had birdies in my ear saying, hey, you know, you could have had 40 properties by now. And, you know, as, as, as you know, and we all know the right strategy for someone is going to change from person to person because it's about their goals, their risk tolerance, and frankly, you know, th their ability to, to handle investments still sleep at night, right? So the right strategy may be different uh, for each one of us. And um, once again, in running through this, I realized I'm like, maybe I should have done some 10, or not maybe, I mean, I should have. Right. I would have probably 40 or 50 properties by now. Um, and I'd convinced myself that, hey, I want to keep, uh, you know, a high, high, uh, a low loan to value and, and a high rent to payment ratio. Um, but there's a happy medium. Right. Which I hadn't explored, um, which is doing some leverage. And as we're going to jump into and cover here, you know, the, the wealth in real estate is built through the ability to participate in appreciation, right? With not putting hundred percent down. So essentially the more, um, you know, branches we have from the tree, the more wealth we're going to build. And I'm kind of going to probably reevaluate all every, all my properties and see, you know, if I can better deploy uh, equity. So yeah, it's been, it's been uh, fun. Okay, Richard, you can't have this hero pick up here and not touch a little bit on your race car experience. Brag on yourself a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, so I started driving professionally a couple of years ago for Formula Drift. If you're not aware, drifting is, you know, it's the opposite of most race car driving. It's, you know, where your your goal is to slide and smoke the tires. And you, you know, we're, we're on tracks that, you know, you're doing 100 plus miles an hour and throwing yourself into to turns and, you know, you're super close to the other car. So it's, it's absolutely an adrenaline rush. Um, but it's really taught me the importance of team as well. Right. You know, even within my own racing program, uh, everyone's job is important. And no matter how good of a job or how good of a driver I think I am, uh, I can't win if I don't have uh, a successful team and everyone on the team doing their job. And, you know, real estate's actually very, very similar as we know, you know, as smart as we are as investors, if you don't have the right team, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's going to be very hard to consistently be a winner and, you know, get to that podium. So yeah, it's been fun. It's, uh, it's fun. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it, you, you learn to deal with extreme highs and extreme lows, right? You have 40 people who are going out there to win and only one of them is going to get first place. And, you know, there's only three of them that goes on the podium. So, um, it's, uh, it's a roller coaster. It's it's such a cool sport. I know you took Rich Fecky out on the course and taught him how to drift and he's an adrenaline junkie. And he said that oh, was yeah. an adrenaline hookup that he hadn't had in quite a while. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool outlet that you have. Definitely.
definitely. So um, I guess we'll kind of jump into it here. Um, and so the, the theme of today, of course, is, hey, does it make sense to redeploy equity in a high rate environment? But also, does it make sense, period, for a lot of us, right? Um, and, you know, some of the thoughts that kind of have been running through my mind, being that more conservative investor, I call it, is, you know, hey, is the fear of losing my low rate personally affecting my strategy and wealth building, right? Am I locked into that low rate and just blind to everything else because I want to retain that, you know, pinching pennies, um, but at the risk of dollars potentially. And then also, what if I don't, you know, need the money to continue pursuing investments, right? Um, and that's been the answer of a lot of my clients as well. Is like, well, I don't need to, you know, pull money to redeploy. I can, you know, I earn a good enough to, to continue purchasing real estate. Um, and also, you know, what is my return on equity on the portfolio? And, you know, these questions are, I th think, very similar questions that all of us have. And, you know, it was... It was good for me to put them on paper as well and then kind of jump into the numbers behind it, uh, not only to have a thought process behind it, but actually to have some data and fact behind it. And, you know, the interesting like I thing, like I said, is, you know, I, I talked to you two weeks ago and said, yeah, I'm more conservative. I haven't cashed out. However, I plan on looking into it because I have a property um, in Austin area, you know, higher priced and less cash flow than the market, you know, that you're dealing with, um, in Texas. And it's done very well for me. Um, however, there's not much cash flow. That's what got me thinking about going down this path. And the interesting thing is it was very, very clear. And I'm not going to say what the path is, but it's very, very clear, obviously, as you guys can see here today of, of what the right thing to do was, but it's also now making me evaluate even the properties that are generating good cash flow, right? And saying, hey, does it make sense to even redeploy those? Even though in my mind, they're great and I have good cash flow and a good rate. Well, based on everything, I wouldn't say that I've learned in the last two weeks, week and a half putting this together, but based on, you know, the things that re-resonated, you know, and, and I think we all know in life when you're, when you're trying to talk to someone um, and teach them something, a lot of times you hear yourself speak and, you know, you, you get ideas that, re-resonate in your, in your mind. That's true. And sometimes just sitting down and like really taking the time to look at the numbers and see the math, like the, the really um, tactical side of this, it, it makes the choice all the more clear, uh, keeping it hypothetical. We might, we might assume a certain decision just based on knowing that it's maybe the easier <laughs> choice of the two, right? You clearly have a lot going on in your life. So this idea of 1031ing all your properties that have a bunch of equity, like that's going to be a lot of work, right? So it would be natural for someone to to just kind of write it off and say, eh, I don't know, it's easier just to stick where it's at. But when you really face those numbers, uh, sometimes it's hard to deny if if your goal is, you know, wealth creation over a specific time period, you know, the numbers say one thing and it, it becomes pretty clear pretty quick. Exactly, exactly. And I think the first thing we're going to do here is kind of, build up um, the long-term effect of real estate as well. I know, you know, a lot of us as investors get stuck on cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, and hitting a certain percentage ROI, um, which look, cash flow is important and determining a cash on cash return is important because it helps evaluate one investment versus another. However, if you're sticking to a target in mind, oftentimes that kind of guides the type of asset you're going to buy. Right. If you're like, I have to hit my 8 percent, well, or 9 percent, you know, most of the time you end up in in Michigan, which I'm, you know, Michigan's a great market. But I'm using it for an example. Right. You end up in a super high cash flow market and with maybe wasn't the picture of that investment you had in mind in terms of quality of asset, but it, it meets your numbers. Right. And, you know, the first thing I try to understand with my clients is, you know, when is cash flow important to them, right? Um, as well as what about the cash flow is important? Because for most of us, even if we get that 6% or 5 or 7%, whatever that investment number is in our head, if we look at the meat and potatoes of it, okay, well, a 7% cash on cash return on a $200,000 property, it's 180 or $200 a month, right? These days, I mean, I'd like to say it's a, it's a dinner out, but maybe even not. Sometimes it's fast food for four or five people. But, you know, that's not the reason we're doing it, right? The reason we're investing in real estate is for the longer term wealth building. And any of you out there that have owned real estate for even three years, but five years, eight years, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, um, I think you can really attest to that as well. And 
you know, there's a reason why we see longer term investors that kind of gear towards a new construction or a very, very well renovated property is, you know, based on their experience, the longevity of the property and the minimization of issues is what's going to build wealth. So jumping into that, the first thing I, I want everyone to know is, you know, if you um, look at the historical national appreciation rate from 87 to 2023, the national appreciation rate is 4.8%. And, um, you know, I think it's important to understand that as a baseline because we're gonna use an appreciation assumption and a rent growth assumption in all the examples that we're gonna use. And the appreciation assumption we're gonna use is much, much lower than the 4.8%. Now you may beg, hey, wonder, it, well, is it gonna continue? Well, this is a 40, 40 year kind of uh, summary. So. That's the point of the statistics. I think we can take 4.8% at face value, but guess what? We're not gonna do that. We're gonna take a much, much lower number as well to help kind of build a long-term wealth building aspect of the real estate. And for also for us to show you, you know, hey, the cash flow is once again very important, but it's a very, very small piece in the wealth building aspect of real estate. Um, now, Leah, anything you wanna add on that before I jump through the next uh, slide here? No, I think it's well said. Beautiful. So I know this question is something that all of us uh, ask ourselves. Uh, you know, historically, what offers a better return, real estate or stocks? And, you know, if we look back over time, uh, stocks have generally offered better returns than real estate investments. Um, and I'm sure you guys are like, well, why are you telling us that? You guys are doing real estate, right? Well, stocks have returned on average about 8 to 12% per year, while real estate has generated returns of 2 to 4% per year. Um, says Peter Earl, you know, he's an economist at the American Institute of Economic Research, so way smarter guy than, than me, at least. Um, now, what's interesting, though, is, you know, when you're investing in real estate, you're investing in real estate, obviously, without putting 100% of the asset. Most of us are putting 20 to 25% down when you buy real estate. Uh, and, you know, for example, of course, if an investor purchases a $100,000 property with 20% down, and the property goes up by 3% in one year, they've gained 15% on their initial investment of 20,000, right? Because the appreciation, that 3% appreciation was based on the $100,000 property. And so if you look at what that return means, obviously once you factor in leverage, the real estate return goes up, depending on how much you put down, by four to five X, right? Which would mean real estate as an investment given that you're not putting 100% down on it, actually far surpasses what the stock market does. And, um, you know, as you can read there in, in, in bold, and, and, you know, this has been resonating with me, as I said, a lot the last week as I put this together, is real estate wealth is not built by cash flow alone, but by the ability to participate in 100% of the growth of the asset with just 20 to 25% down. And that's what makes real estate outperform um, the stock market. And that's really the premise, I think, of of all the examples that, that we're going to get into here is, you know, instead of having one, you know, uh, arm of a, or branch of a tree, uh, if you have five branches of the tree, right, those are all going to continue growing and growing as opposed to just the one, no matter how good your interest rate is, and no matter how good your cash flow is, if you're allowing that to dictate your strategy, you're only paying attention to a third of the wealth building aspect of real estate. And so I have my own, my own uh, uh, example pulled up here. I'm sure some of you are going to Google the address and fact check me. So you're welcome to do that. Um, <laughs> but 5820 Blackstone, it's a home I bought in 2019, uh, $200,000 outside of Austin, right? Crazy steal. When I bought it at the time, it was the least cash flow I've ever bought on any property. And I knew that, but I knew also what was happening growth-wise. Um, and I knew it was going to be a good investment. And it was, right? Because sitting here we are, you know, four years later, the property is now worth in the low 300000 range. Um, however, property taxes have gone up very sharply as well. They started very high. They've gone up even higher. And although rents have gone up from where I bought it, I'm making $148 a month roughly on this property. And that's a gross return, right? Right. Look, as Leah's disclaimer said, we're talking about broad numbers. Um, the 148, you know, if I factor in, I haven't had much maintenance repair in four years because it's a brand new property, but you factor in small little things here and there, it's probably a little less. 
Um, but I do factor in a, on this performer here, a 5% vacancy, um, which I don't think I have a pointer, but you'll note to the middle of the page, you'll see um, I have a vacancy built in there as well. And then the other assumption I want you to look at to the bottom left under assumptions is the appreciation and rent growth, okay? So the assumptions that we've used in, in well, this example as well as in the other examples that we use here is 3% appreciation and 3% rent growth. And if you remember earlier, statistically per case Schiller, the national average for appreciation is 4.8 over the last 40 years. So I think most of you out there will agree that 3% is conservative, 3% is realistic. Um, and I wanted to get your buy-in on that number um, because what, also you'll see on this page is um, the years to exit. I think you can see my mouse moving around over there. Mm -hmm. And um, this is modeled off of a 15 year return to exit. And what this basically does is it looks at the cash flow, right? Assuming a 3% per year rent growth, right? More or less keeping up with inflation. It also uh, looks at the appreciation based on a 3% rate, right? Um, not quite half of the national average, but definitely significantly less than the 4.7. Um, and it also looks at principal pay down based on looking at a normal 30 year fixed at 5.375 is the rate I had. And what's amazing here, and you know, pay attention to the amount I invested on this property, right? Mm -hmm. I invested, my down payment was 40,000 plus closing costs, roughly 47,000. Now, the, te the total 15 year return on this property is $263,301, right? And that's based on my investment of $47,000. And the reason why I'm using a 3% appreciation rate, I, you know, look, do, do I think it's gonna appreciate more than that? Yes, you know, uh, probably closer to the statistical average. That's the point of having that statistical average. You know, if we look long-term, if we're looking 10, 15 years out, I think it's safe to assume we'll hit that. However, um, I went with the very low number just to build this as a case and example. This total return of $263,000, if you agree with the assumption of 3% appreciation and rent growth, it's just math at that point that gets us there, right? Um, and look at the cash flow. It's $148 a month, right? Mm -hmm. um, although the assets perform very well for me, it's not a lot. And even at a meek $148 a month in cash flow, this property bills $263,000 of wealth over 15 years from just my $47,000 down payment and closing costs. And that is why we're investing in real estate, right? I bought this property at very meager cash flow, um, not because $148. Yeah, was, it even, was it even positive when you bought it? It was like $47 positive when I bought it. Um, but I did buy it for that $47 to pay for three Big Macs right. and a fries. Not that I eat all that on my own. Um, but <laughs> I bought it for this number here, right? The 15 year, the total return number. And, you know, if, if I change an appreciation number down there to five or 6%, which look, you'll see that in the pro form of a lot of markets that Real Wealth deals with, and because that is probably a realistic targeted number. But even if you put it at 3%, right? Look at the wealth building that, that you experience mm -hmm. off this property, 260,000 versus a $47,000 investment. And it's very hard to find stocks that will do that for you, right? Most, and most of the time when people are comparing stocks to real estate, getting back to that original example, the way you calculate, you know, the stock growth is just, hey, it's gone up in value, right? And in that example, we're, we're only looking at going up in value in real estate. We weren't looking at the cash flow or the principal paid on all the other benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what got me thinking. I'm like, wait a minute. So I have this property worth north of $300,000 now. Um, and I owe, I put 20% down. So I owe still 140 and change on it. So I'm like, I've got 150 gross, $150,000, $160,000 in equity. Um, what would it look like putting that to work? And, you know, there's more and more markets coming out with new construction or turnkey, really good quality inventory that even with higher rates, they generate a very good return um, or they're buying down the interest rate, right? In a lot of markets that uh, you guys have negotiated with the builder. So I was like, let me, let me take a look at this a little closer because here's an example of a property that's only making 150 a month. And once again, it's a 300 plus thousand dollar asset. It's done well by me, but maybe it's time to put that to work because I keep seeing 
you know, the deal web, you know, all the emails coming across from you guys as well. And I'm like, oh, 250 in cash flow, 350 in cash flow. Um, you know, I'm cheating myself by not exploring this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the next slide. Anything you want to add there, Leah? Mm -mm. Okay. What? I think I went too far. Let's go back one. Okay. So let's kind of jump through and run through the deal, right? Um, current valuation is roughly 307,000. I bought it for 200,000. Um, my current cash on cash return is 3.8%. I have about $150,000 in equity gross, of course. Um, and, uh, my return on equity. So I was like, you know what, for this $157,000 in, in extra, um, in equity I have, you know, what am I making on that with my cash flow? right? We as investors only focus on uh, our ROI, right? How much money are we making based on our initial investment? And that's a great way to evaluate properties. However, when you're three, four, five, eight, 10, 15 years down the line, it's very important to look at, okay, well, now that the property's grown in value and there is more equity, what is the cost of me not putting that equity to work, right? And, and as a whole asset, so for me, as a $307,000 asset, what am I actually making for my ROI, right, on that? And, and you know, the answer was it was, it was a marginal amount. It was 1.1%, um, as you can see in this example. Um, and once again, seeing all these other opportunities coming around, I was like, okay, let me look at this again a little deeper and start running the numbers to see what makes sense. Now, it's important to still note, as you guys saw, my 15-year return on it was still $263,000. So if I stay the course, mm -hmm. still a solid investment, even yep. at the $147 cash flow. Um, but as you guys will see, uh, taking action generates just a huge amount of wealth uh, versus just staying put and being comfortable and being that conservative investor um, that I thought I was and that I think I am. But now I'm starting to think maybe a little foolish. Yeah. So we so we talked about kind of the three core ways to like tap into the equity. And that's kind of what you're going to do a, a scenario breakdown for us, starting with cash out refinance. Then we'll get into the HELOC scenario um, and then we'll finally end it with the 1031 exchange strategy. So I really appreciate kind of the let's look at the same property and let's do the math on three different scenarios um, and see what we can create with it. Beautiful. All right. And I know we've got probably 30 minutes. I think I'm doing okay on time, guys. Um, but let's jump into the strategy. So yeah, three options is Leah mentioned. Hey, do I pull out a HELOC so I can keep my super low rate first? Do I do a refi of my first, you know, take a new first mortgage, once again, foregoing my low rate? Uh, or do I do a 1031? With either of the options, I, I, I end, at the end, I have two properties, right? If I cash out refi and buy another, I like keep that property on Blackstone and I invest, or if I do a HELOC that still ends up with uh, just one purchase. And the last option of doing a 1031, I sell Blackstone and now I buy two properties to replace it. Either way, the important thing that you guys will see is ending up with the two properties versus the one, whichever strategy you take is where the wealth is made, right? right. And that's where, you know, um, I think I could have find, found a little better balance with my strategy till now. Um, so as we ran through current value, 310,000, it went up 3,000 um, in the time I've been talking to you guys. No, I'm kidding, it was, we had 307 <laughs> on the last one. Um, max loan to value on cash out is 75%. So the max loan I could take if I decided to refinance the first mortgage and do a new cash out loan would be $232,500. That's 75% of 310, right? Now from that, I would need to subtract my existing loan balance as well as closing costs. That would put my net proceeds in this at about $59,000. And my new loan at 232,500 um, at a 6.99% puts my principal and interest payment at 1522. Now that almost doubles my payment um, from the, I think it's eight or 900 principal and interest right now. Now what that would do for me though, is that would put my overall front end cash flow situation at negative 533 a month, which means, hey, with that uh, 59,000, I need to go out and try to generate at least $533 per month. And, you know, that is very possible. I went through all of the amazing markets and properties that Real Wealth has to offer, and I handpicked two or three examples. 
And those are the examples I went forward with. Um, depending on your proceeds, you know, this, for example, potentially could have bought almost two properties with these proceeds, just depending on where you look. So, you know, work with your investment counselor and they'll kind of get more specific with you. Yeah. So just to be clear with that, the net proceeds, that 59,000, that's the cash that you're going to get a check for after closing this cash out refi. And then your new cash flow on the house you're going to keep uh, is negative. It's now negative 533 bucks. Correct. Got it. Correct. But of course, we're looking at uh, the whole scenario of what these uh, what you can do with that initial investment. And that's the beautiful thing here as well is, you know, my initial investment into the end, whichever process you pick is was that forty seven thousand dollars to buy, you know, the, the property um, that Blackstone property. So not to confuse things, but what you'll see in front of you is an opportunity available in North Texas through, um, I think they're the, not the next webinar, but the webinar coming up after that on the schedule uh, you guys saw at the beginning. Uh, so this is a brand new construction property, 199,000 purchase price, um, and the total cash invested $58,705. Now, if you remember, my net proceeds from um, the cash out transaction was, $59,000. So this actually fit right in the bucket. I didn't skew any of those numbers to get it to line up. I promise it, it actually literally perfectly fit. Um, so with this pro uh, opportunity in North Texas, the monthly cash flow every year on this opportunity is $409 a month, right? Um, this particular example, what does put us at, um, bear with me, does put us in a situation where we are roughly $120 negative, right, um, from uh, our cash flow position, right? Because we're at 533, if you saw, and this is going to generate roughly 400 and change of positive cash flow. Um, and that put, once again, in a position where I would be coming out of pocket 100 to $120. And, you know, once again, I used this example. Um, I am, I am, I see the benefit in buying a new construction asset and taking less cash flow versus, say, uh, an older asset, even if it's, it's turnkey. Um, there are lots of opportunities that Real Wealth have. I mean, I probably should have used one of those for this example, too, that, that will generate the $500 uh, in positive cash flow or have lower purchase price ranges. However, as you can see here, the before, I'm not going to go through it, but uh, we've already gone through, obviously, the equity and cash flow situation of Blackstone. Um, and then the after situation, right? So the after situation is purchasing uh, this new construction property in North Texas, right, that we went over. It's generating $409 in cash flow based on 25% down. Um, the total cash invested is right in line with the cash proceeds I had. And if you look at this here, the total cash flow... Um, is negative 124 a month, right? Um, however, that's only looking at our front end cash flow, okay? That's not looking at appreciation. That's also not looking at return on amortization, which I think is something that's overlooked uh, a lot. The return on amortization starting day one, even though a 30 year fixed, as we all know, no matter how low your, your interest rate is, uh, you pay almost all interest at the beginning, right? So you're paying mainly interest. You're barely paying down principal. Even with uh, taking that in mind, you're paying down $373 a, a month in principal with your first payment, right? So although you're negative 124 in cash flow on the front end, starting payment number one, you're paying down $373 of debt. And that's taking into account both properties. That's why mm -hmm. I came up with that 373 that you're paying down every month. So there's still a net gain of wealth to your pocket of $250 a month. And that's something I factored in when analyzing this investment. Now, um, there's also a front end now, an, a cash on cash return um, for the North Texas property we're buying of 8.3% on that investment itself. Um, the important thing though here is you guys will see at the bottom. So the 15 year return uh, given that now where I'm participating in the growth of Blackstone plus this property in North Texas, right? As we discussed, the beauty of real estate is participating in 100% of the growth with just putting uh, a fractional amount down. Now, the total return on this now went from $260,000, 15-year outlook that we looked at before on my Blackstone. But now 
in 15 years, this new asset that I bought is going to generate $222,000, right? And that's using the assumptions that, that you saw in the previous example, 3% appreciation, 3% rank growth, national appreciation, once again, is 4.7, okay? Um, so this example to me was still an absolute winner. Yes, there was a reduction in cash flow on, you know, at the beginning, right? You're looking at a reduction of a hundred and some dollars in front of net cash flow. Um, you make that up with your principal pay down every single month, but more importantly, the wealth building aspect of real estate really shines here, right? Participating yeah. in that growth of that second asset. Um, so this, once again, still way better of an option than doing nothing, right? And uh, I'm sure, Lee, already in your head, you're thinking of examples to where um, that 58000 could have generated an overall positive on this deal. Yeah, this is what I did. I mean, with, with the deal that you helped me with, I did a cash out refinance. The difference was the property I purchased was a short term rental, which gives me a much higher, you know, cash flow. So, you know, the, the cash flow wasn't quite as impacted, but definitely the, the goal was the long term, right? It was is controlling two good assets for the same amount of time. I wasn't ready to get rid of the house uh, that I had bought. It was still brand new and I feel like the market still had some ways to go. So, so it made sense in my situation to hang on to it. Exactly. And the question to me at the end of the day was, Hey, do I want to look at the, and participate in the wealth building of a second asset for the cost of a dinner out 120 bucks a month. Now I have two different arms that are growing as well as paying down principal. Um, and then as you know, participating in all the tax advantages, which we haven't even talked about, which we'll save right. for another one, but, um, perfect. All right. So that's option number one that I looked at, right. was a cash out strategy, um, refinancing existing first mortgage strategy. Number two was a home equity line. Now, a lot of you out there, no matter how good the numbers look, and I'm not going to dog you for it, but you're you're married to that low rate you have, right? If you've got a three and a half, a four, a four and a half, you're like, I don't want to touch it. I don't care how much money I'm going to make. Um, well, here's an alternative for you, right? It's it's uh, utilizing a home equity line. Now, keep in mind, home equity lines are based on the prime rate, the prime rate, the Fed rate. They're going to hopefully start lowering in another month, but they are very high. Um, so on average home equity lines, you're looking at 10 to 11% interest. Um, and for a lot of us, that's put the brakes on and saying, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to sit on the property. I'm not going to do anything because I don't want to take a five and a half, six percent, six and a half percent cash out refi. Um, I don't want to take a 10% ELOC. Um, instead, let me sit on the property. And as we're going to continue to explore through all of these, um, doing nothing is costing, um, a lot of us and it's cost me a lot of wealth building. So with yeah. the home equity line, um, pulling up the example again here, it's a $310,000 uh, is the value of the property roughly, this Blackstone Drive. Maximum loan to value for a HELOC for an, uh, an investment property, 75%, um, with uh, puts us minus closing costs at a um, max home equity line amount of $72,500. Now, well, one thing to note is uh, for this example, we only needed roughly $69,000 of that $72,000 home equity line to accomplish the purchases that we're gonna go over here. The payment on that equity line is uh, $631 a month. And that negative 431 cash flow is referring to that cash flow on Blackstone, right? If you remember it at 140 some or 30 some positive. So the net, uh, a negative now in that property is, is $431. So the question is, can we generate $431 in cash flow with $69,000? And I think you guys are really like this example. Uh, once again, the difference between this and the last example uh, on the net pay positive and negative on cash flow is just the properties I picked as an example. Okay. Um, that prior example had me net coming in with a hundred and some dollars, right? And cash flow is negative, but once again, that could have been remedied with a different property purchase. All right. Now, Richard, so before, this, you, before you yep. jump into the, the specifics of, of what you might buy, HELOCs can be kind of tricky with investment property. I know, you know, a lot of people are, are considering HELOCs on their primary homes, but sometimes getting a HELOC when you have a fully leveraged asset is, is difficult. Can you speak to kind of that aspect? Yeah, well, I guess the first thing that, to remember is uh, a home equity line is only going to go up to 75% of the total 
of the value of the property minus existing liens you have. And one thing we deal with a lot is people calling and saying, hey, I've got 80,000, 90,000 in equity. Well, that 90,000 in equity, a lot of times puts you already at the, you're already at 75%, right? That's equity you can't access. So first things first is make sure you have, you know, if you're at a 50% or 60% loan to value situation, you're a great candidate to go in for an equity line. Um, equity lines are qualifying products, right? So they are gonna look at your total income versus your total debt and liabilities. A lot of people think because it's in second lien position, it's gonna be easier or less paperwork intensive to get an equity loan. And alternatively, it's actually a little harder just because of the fact you know, in, in practice, a, a home equity line, a second loan, what that really means is if you were to default as a customer, that second lien holder only gets paid after the first mortgage is paid if there's money left over, right? right. So home equity line, second lien products generally are more of a risky product, which means they do scrutinize your income and everything a little more. Now, does it mean they're hard to get? No, it just takes a little more effort. Um, you know, if you have the equity, and you, in general, do qualify for mortgages. If you're pre-approved to buy a rental, that means your debt-to-income ratio probably works and will probably work for an equity line, whether it's on your primary home or on an investment property. Mm -hmm. We found that fewer lenders will do the second lien HELOC. It's just not their business. You guys at Guaranteed Rate will do a second lien HELOC, right? Correct, yes. Great. All right. So yep. there you go. We're we're going to do a class just so people know uh, part of this series of tapping into your equity. equity. We're going to do a class, a deep dive in just HELOCs. So we'll we'll get you some additional information. We're just going to illustrate, you know, kind of what, what you can do with a HELOC, but not so much the specifics of how to get the HELOC. We'll give you that class later. Beautiful. Um, all right. So whoop. I just, my screen went black here, Leah. Do you think you uh -oh. can... Um, jump into control of that. I don't know why that happened. Yeah, Celia, if you can advance. But it went black. You can't see? You can't see your screen? No. Let's see. Uh -oh. huh. Let's see if it lets her. Okay, well, it did advance. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm going to have to lean real close to read this. But <laughs> so with the HELOC purchase example, I used a property in Cleveland, Ohio, actually own property in Cleveland myself. Um, great market, offers really, really good cash flow. And I know Real Wealth is very, very thorough about vetting um, all of their partners, myself included. So you, know, you can have some faith in the quality of this investment. But if you pull this up here, you look at the total monthly cash flow is at $435 a month with the total invested is 69,000. Now, um, if you guys looked uh, with the cash out example we had on the uh, prior screen for the equity loan, um, I think on $39,000. Uh, if you can take us to the next screen here, Celia, that would be great. I'm trying to see if I can get my computer to re cooperate. Yeah, take, take a sec if you need Richard to, to get it right. I know it's gonna be hard for you to read all these numbers from your phone. <clears throat> Okay, I got my screen back. Let's see if I'm still actually connected to this. Oh, okay, sweet. I'm back in control. Beautiful. All right. So um, the payment on this equity line, you remember our goal with the HELOC strategy was, hey, can we generate at least $431 a month, which would put us break even between both properties, right? No positive, no negative with cash flow, um, and that it would cover itself. And the answer to that with this property is yes, right? This property generates $435 a month in positive cash flow, gets us right over our minimum threshold of 431. And if you look at both of these, uh, uh, you know, the before and after together, once again, you know, and getting back to the on, the, on the before, keeping just one property, keeping that property in Blackstone, which historically has done very well for me, uh, has a 15 year return of $263,000. Um, and instead now, hey, I'm gonna keep that property. I'm gonna get an equity line. I'm gonna use that equity line to buy this cash flowing investment in Cleveland. And the income that the investment generates is gonna actually make the payment on my equity line as well right? Uh, which is the, the dream scenario. So with this one, um, the total combined value now of my assets is 547,000, right? It's Blackstone plus this purchase in Cleveland. Um, 
in addition to that, um, the total cash invested, 69,000, all of which came from the equity line, right? The closing costs of the equity line are wrapped up in the line itself. Um, the total net cash flow across the board is up $4 a month, yippee. I'm not investing for cash flow every month though, as I mentioned, I'm investing for that 15 year number. And, you know, are we saying sell your asset in 15 years? Not necessarily, I just use that as a number. I like to be in properties at least 10 years. They're performing well, I'll keep them forever and ever. Um, the return on investment of that Cleveland purchase independently was seven and a half percent. Um, and it's important to note here, the principal pay down every month between the existing property on Blackstone plus the new purchase in Cleveland is $454 a month, which is a lot of money, guys. It's really important to pay attention to that, right? That's $6,000 a month in wealth building. You know, just imagine six grand a month, someone puts in a piggy bank for you that you can't touch, but it's there and it's being built. You know, it's very important to remember that back end wealth building aspect. Now, here's the amazing thing about this. So the 15 year return goes from just the 263,000 that I was going to make on um, if I just retained Blackstone till the end um, to now I'm making two, I'm making 230,000 for a 15 year return on Cleveland based on that 3% appreciation and 3% rent growth plus the 260,000 for Blackstone. So I'm looking at a 590,000 or $600,000 total growth and wealth building over a 15 year term. And once again, I took the time to go over the national appreciation with you guys. So to give you a level of confidence in these numbers I'm throwing out, right? 230,000 for Cleveland and 260,000 for, for blacks. And I want to reiterate it's based mm -hmm. on an appreciation rate way less than the national average. And that is how compound interest and in math works, right? That's why investing is so magical. Um, and those numbers, um, do your own diligence and research as per the disclaimer at the start of this, but those numbers should be very conservative. So this HELOC made more sense than the first scenario. The cash out refinance, I think our 15 year return was at like 480 or something. Um, and with this HELOC, it's at 590. I mean, what do you like high level attribute like this one being so much more lucrative, even though Cleveland is a slower growing market typically than an area like Dallas? Well, so one thing to keep in mind is we're using the same assumptions across the board. We're using that 3% appreciation where in all reality, okay. you are gonna see more appreciation, I would think, in places like Texas versus uh, Cleveland. Although, okay. who knows, right? We've seen so much growth in a lot of these these metros. Um, but the other thing too is is the cash flow difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're using really broad numbers. You know, um, if you're looking at a 15 year return in all reality, I would assume this Cleveland property is going to need probably need some maintenance over and above what say the new purchase in North Dallas would need. Um, those haven't been factored in here. We're looking at really just a broad level idea of, hey, does this make sense? Each one of the investors, myself included, needs to go through and drill down and do your diligence on these investments. If we got into um, building in, you know, renov uh, excuse me, maintenance costs and renovation costs and vacancy costs and all of these, we would be on this, this webinar take four hours to do. So this yeah, is sure. a very broad <laughs> level of view on, on comparing the investments. Um, but it's also important to note is, you know, yes, the Cleve, this is a real world example, right? As investors, you're going to have opportunities to buy a turnkey renovated property that will generate more cash flow than, say, a brand new construction property, right? Which, if there was no repairs on either of the assets, that additional $100, $200 a month in cash flow compounded over 15 years does make a big difference, right? Um, the difference, though, is in the real world scenario, we are going to have maintenance costs and probably mm -hmm. turnover costs um, in a turnkey product that we wouldn't have in a new construction product. Yep. Again, another good illustration that owning owning more is the right decision. Uh, there's some nuances to which one here could be best, but the, the clear winner is get two instead of one. Exactly, and that's the recurring theme, you know, once again, we're gonna see is into this nest example as well. Um, and the thing that's really made me reevaluate my strategy in the last 15 years is like, okay, well, I'm at 50% LTV on a lot of my portfolio. Could I have gone to 65 or 70 and bought, you know, another six, eight, 10 properties and participated in the growth of those right. properties. And then on each one of those, the, the magic happens, right? Because each one of those arms now 
right. are going to be in a position where five to eight years where you can have them have little investment babies, right? Whether <laughs> they choose to use a HELOC strategy for their baby or a 1031, right? They're going to have arms and that's how the M5 is built, right? Yep. And uh, once again, tax benefits, tax benefits, tax benefits. Uh, a lot of us are investing for the next generation. And if that's you, congratulations that you found real estate because, you know, with the 1031, you're going to defer um, taxes, defer taxes, defer taxes, defer taxes. And when you die someday and your heirs inherit that property, they get to step up in tax and cost basis, right? So their cost of that property is what it's worth the day you die. And all that money you deferred um, in capital gains is gone now, poof, right? Um, and that's part of tax code, whether that exists when you know I pass and you guys passed, who knows? But as of the moment, that's all completely uh, legal and that's, you know, it's part of tax strategy. So, you know, yeah. um, stocks, stocks do allow a step up in cost basis as well. All right. So, um, the 1031 strategy is ultimately, um, still gets us to a point where we end up with two properties, right? But it involves actually selling that 5820 Blackstone, whereas, um, you know, the initial strategy that we, the two strategies we went over so far is keeping it. Um, by the way, you guys watching this, if you want to buy the house, 5820 Blackstone, I'm sure you did a lot of research on it. Let me know. <laughs> but at market value, hey, it's not going to be cash flow. Positive. No, and it didn't, it didn't cash flow with your low interest rate either. No. We don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So third strategy, 1031, um, sell te uh, Blackstone reinvest the money into North Texas and Birmingham, Alabama. I picked, um, you know, once again, another great turnkey market that you guys offer. Uh, current value of the property, 310,000 current loan, as we know is 160 roughly. My total proceeds in a 1031 after closing costs and agent commissions, I factored roughly 7%, gives me $125,000 in net proceeds. And the cash flow that Blackstone was generating was $148 a month. So my goal is, hey, what can we do with a 1031? Got 125K net, um, tax-free, and um, I need to replace $148 in cash flow. And do you guys remember this? It's what's amazing, right? I've got $125,000 to invest now. What did I invest when I bought this property? 47,000, right? Um, my net four years later, after fees and everything is, is, you know, almost tripled, you know, two and a half times when I put into this deal. Um, you know, thank you, real estate gods. All right. So moving into um, this next strategy here. Perfect. So uh, this is example number one. I'm not going to run through it again in detail. You guys already saw this North Texas property in example number one, the uh, cash out example. This property is a total of roughly $59,000 invested and generates $409 in monthly cash flow uh, year one. Uh, the next property that uh, I threw in the mix here was a property in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, that was $45,000 total invested and uh, monthly cash flow of $331. And this property purchase price was 152,000. Now this is a turnkey property existing on the market property um, uh, that's generating obviously a very, very good return here. So the summary of these running through again, currently if I was to sit on the property as is, it's gonna generate roughly $263,000 um, in the next 15 years. I'm making $148 a month in front end cash flow and I'm paying down 238 a month in principal paid out, right? That's from my current home. Instead, I'm gonna sell that, I'm gonna buy these two properties. Um, and I think what happens here is pretty magical. So firstly, the total valuation between both assets is 440,000. My total monthly cash flow, oh, okay, my total monthly cash flow uh, goes from 140 some a month all the way to 844 dollars a month, right? Huge impact in cash flow. Now, with 144 a month, I could barely go out to dinner with my family. With 844, we can go out to dinner at least a handful of times. Uh, once again, cash flow not extremely important to me. I know why I'm investing in it, and even though that 844 is amazing, that's not why I'm investing in this real estate. The reason I'm investing in it is. Uh, the end 15-year return number. If you look at that 15-year return number, once again, based on 
3% appreciation, 3% um, uh, rent growth. It's $632,000 is my 15 year return on this investment versus the 263 if I chose not to do anything. Um, and this really was uh, an amazing example. And once again, made me question my strategy uh, until now and is really gonna, I think, dictate my strategy moving forward, right? I've got so many properties um, and a lot of the other properties I have uh, actually ha are in a good cash flow position, right? Because I haven't refined them. I'm making six, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars a month cash flow, fifteen percent cash on cash. If I look at my initial acquisition costs, right? Because rents have gone up. Um, but I am victim of everything I'm saying not to do, which is don't focus just on cash flow. And I've done that, and I've been blind to all this equity I've built up. And and you know what started it once again was Blackstone, because I was like, I'm not making cash flow. Let me look at this. And then as I look through it, as I've come to the conclusion, just like I've done with you guys here, I'm like, what have I been doing? I could have had 40 properties that have appreciated now instead of 20, right? I could have been appreciating or sorry, participating in the appreciation of so many more assets. Um, now, does that mean I'm gonna go max leverage on everything now and go buy 30 more properties? No, right? I still gonna find a happy balance point that's comfortable for me. Um, but it's important to push out of your comfort zone. And I didn't do that. And I, I, I'm starting to realize it's probably cost me a lot of money in the last decade because, you know, I could have uh, diversified more. And which option did I choose? I think it's obvious to all of you guys. I was very clear. The winner was a 1031 um, exchange process, which I am going through with as we speak. I realized I have a tenant in there for another year. So I'm trying to incentivize them and bribe them to leave early. Because uh, I realized not having that two instead of one is costing me a lot of money. Um, and, you know, of course, while a cash out refinance or home equity line still would have allowed me to participate in the growth of, of two assets, uh, the cash flow situation with these investments was 5x on what I'm currently doing. You know, I have a very, very low cash flow situation. Um, and also, I think, look, moving forward and, and in general, the national housing shortage we see of six, seven million homes, it's in rural areas, it's in growing areas, it's in the affordable price range. And it's amazing, I bought that Austin home at that affordable range. There's a lot of us have bought our real estate as affordable homes. Well, they've gone up, they've doubled, they tripled in value. They're not that super affordable product that we originally bought as an investment. Um, now is the opportunity in my mind to, um, you know, get rid of them and move back into super high cash flowing, super affordable housing that allowed us to participate obviously in, in all of that growth. So, you know, what the, I, I guess I kind of went over uh, the conclusion on those, those um, remarks, but, you know, just to reiterate the bulk of real estate wealth is built by the, by it's built by the ability to participate in a hundred percent of the growth without investing a hundred percent of the money. And, you know, whether, no matter what strategy we're utilizing, um, you know, it, having two investments versus one is always going to be uh, the win. And, you know, invest wisely, invest conservatively. At the end of the day, everyone's investment strategy is going to be different, as we discussed. And the right strategy is going to be different as well. Um, but it's also OK to make mistakes. We all as investors and as entrepreneurs, we have to keep asking ourselves a question again of whether we're on the right path. And uh, I'm really glad, honestly, Leah, I mean, 15 years from now, I'm going to look back and because I am going to do a lot of changes in my portfolio and and probably 1031 a lot of properties. And I'm going to look back and I'm going to be like, wow, OK, I've made an extra couple million dollars in the last 15 years because of that phone call I got from you. And I told you I was already on the start of that train where I was like, yeah, you, your timing's perfect because I was just thinking about <laughs> this. I have this property that is not really cash flowing and and um, preparing this, you know, it's, it's been good to share it with everyone, but it's, it's changed things for me for sure. You know, I'm, I'm gonna have well, to get I only more request, active. I only request 2% of your <laughs> earnings. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a really, really good overview, Richard. And, um, you know, it, I think the metric that people should be looking at to kick this off is calculating return on equity of their properties. Um, do you have any advice for people on, on how or when, or, you know, the context with calculating return on equity, any specifics there? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess basically you want to look at, look, that's a broad term to get, to get 
the thought process established in our head. The good thing is if you didn't, if since you have all the resources like Real Wealth available to you, my advice is reach out to your counselor, put together an actual plan, right? Instead of worrying about the broad numbers, um, you know, and look at what a 1031 would do. If you have a property with you know, over, I would say, forty to sixty thousand dollars in equity is probably the sweet spot. A lot of us have properties with one hundred ten, hundred twenty thousand um, dollars in equity. Um, the answer always is going to be, you know, two is better than one. Um, but figuring out the exact uh, investments to go into is something your counselors can help with. But to calculate it, obviously, is you know very, very simple. Is you know what, how much equity do you have, and how much cash flow are you making um, on the whole investment? Right. And how much or what is the value of the investment? So in my example, I'm making one hundred twenty three dollars a month in cash flow on a three hundred thousand dollar asset. Um, whereas traditionally I look at it, I'm like, well, I'm making one hundred twenty three in cash flow on my forty thousand dollar investment. Right. Well, mm-hmm. you know, my investment has grown quite a bit now. And that means the profit percentage of return based on the overall value of assets gone down. Right. And that's mm-hmm. something I've been right. I, I was blind to. Um, yeah. And, this you know, it's easy. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, this is the situation I hear most often from people. It's a lot of the California, you know, investors who held on to a former primary or who bought a little duplex in these high cost markets and they're collecting really high gross rents and it feels like good cash flow. But these homes have also appreciated significantly while they've held them. Um, and I think this is who really needs to look at return on equity of, of what they're currently holding and consider how going out of state could really, in, especially in that 15 year time horizon, really change the life of their, you know, heirs and of themselves too. Exactly. Yeah. I think a lot of people watching this, uh, it'll kind of be an eye opener for them as well. Cause I think a good majority of our clients have very, very busy day jobs and uh, they're very, very successful in all their own fields and they want real estate to be passive and that's why they buy it. Uh, And it's very easy to set it and forget about it, right? Even especially when your asset's doing very, very well, right? It's very easy to just think, I bought it, it's killing it, rents went up a little, values went up, I'm excited. Well, it's as important to take a moment and reanalyze that amazing investment to see, hey, if I if I reinvest this or if I get more creative with this, what what would that do? And what is the lost opportunity I have right now from just being comfortable mm-hmm. and saying, hey, it's done well, it's done good. And that's the bucket mm-hmm. I've fallen into, you know, and I've done very yeah. well. Don't get me wrong. It's nice to have a low loan to value and, and um, you know, a good amount of cash flow every month on, you know, properties that I've bought in the last 10 years. However, as we all saw here, cash flow is just a small part of it. And now I'm looking back like, okay, well, if I wasn't this 10 years ago, probably would have had another 10 or 12 properties and all of those would have grown and pray down the principal balance. And, you know, and, and, and I don't say that they would have grown based on, um, you know, the crazy appreciation we've experienced. Once again, remember everyone, these examples and and this 15 year number we're doing is based on 3% appreciation. These numbers are, um, you know, should be very, very realistic to obtain. They're not based on even what we've experienced in the last six or seven years. I think we're at 7% appreciation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Three. Right. You were conservative for sure. Yeah. Okay. We've got a couple questions that people have sent in. Let's work our way through some of these. Um, the first question was, I want to take out a HELOC and start real estate investing, but I've been hearing it's difficult to invest with HELOC funds. Basically, the lenders can deny investors from using HELOC funds as the down payment. Is there any truth to that? No, there isn't actually. So I've been in the business 20 years and ever since day one, um, secured borrowed funds are permissible for purchasing an investment property. And because a home equity line is secured against your home, it's a secured borrowed funds and they are 100% okay. All we're going to ask for is an equity line statement. We're going to factor in the monthly payment, of course, that's going to um, uh, start as soon as you take out the funds, but it's 100% permissible. I think where people get confusion is You know, credit cards or equity lines in general are not because they're not secured, right? You can't pull out 20 grand out of a credit card and use it as a down payment. However, Mm -hmm. secured line, so a home equity line, absolutely is allowed. Um, I've had people go and pull out a line on automobiles or refit, like, hey, I got this paid off car. I'm so excited I paid it off. You know, back to this, this, you know, participating in the growth model. I've had a friend who paid off a car and, you know, held its value. And he's like, hey, I've got a $30,000 car paid off. 
I don't have money to invest in real estate and he went and refight his car. Um, and now he had you know, <laughs> money to invest. I'm not recommending to do that, um, but uh, it's not hard to do at all. Um, it's, it's completely allowed with conventional loans, with FHA, with Jumbo, with any type of loan. Home equity loans are absolutely permitted. Hey, I like the idea of taking a, letting a depreciating asset purchase an appreciating asset. That sounds like a good move for him. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. This is a good question. Uh, Yunha asks, what is your take on the 1031 exchange? Is Or what is your take on the 1031 exchange is easier said than done sentiment? A lot of sellers in the market recently are complaining about how hard it is to actually execute this and find the right assets within the deadline. Any advice or take on that opinion? Uh, you are absolutely right if you weren't on a real wealth webinar right now, right? <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I helped, I helped a family member put together a 1031 uh, a month ago. And um, my brother's very, very intelligent. And he went through and did all his diligence. He's like, oh, I can find opportunities. And I heard this area is good and that area is good. I'm like, there's no way you're going to find positive cash flow. Just, like, I know I have a good pulse on the market, but he did his independent research. And um, 15 days out from the last day to identify, he's like, I've been trying for 30 days and it's an absolute nightmare, right? Firstly, where do you start? How do you identify a good market? Then you study the market. Then you find out what part in the property, what price range and what the rents are. And then you find the right property and you submit an offer. You're all excited. Guess what? There's 30 other offers. You get outbid, right? <laughs> it's deflating. That's what I, what I call that is buying retail. Uh, the amazing thing about dealing with real wealth and all their markets is you're not buying a retail, right? If you call Lee and said, Hey, I've got a 1031, if it's 1 million or 6 million, and mm -hmm. I've got 45 days to identify, I probably bet you in three days, she would have lists of properties to you think, pick which one you want. They're off market. They're available. Yeah. They're ready to go. So for yes, for the average person on the street, absolutely. How do you identify 45, pro excuse me. How do you identify enough properties in 45 days and know they're going to close and know they're going to be available to you? You can't without mm -hmm. an organization like Real Wealth, right? Um, they can all make it happen in days as opposed to um, weeks. So if you're buying retail and if you try to wing it on your own, there's no way. You're right. Um, and yeah. most sellers, um, whoever, if you've heard that from sellers, uh, you know, realwealth.com and <laughs> let them know they can put it together. <laughs> super. But it's the truth of the matter, right? The service. Yeah that that all of us offer that especially you guys offer you it's 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 unquantifiable because it can't be done unless yep. you have access to a network um, right like you guys thanks for that plug richard yeah i mean we we've, we've got deals all the time i mean and honestly if you're doing a 1031 you haven't connected with your real wealth investment counselor you should i mean deals are crossing our desk every day the teams are sending us stuff that you know, the, the deals that fell out of contract that they need to sell. I mean, yesterday we sent out a promo with two already rented new construction homes in Florida that both cash flow over 500 bucks a month. Um, really impressive properties. So yeah, we, we help with that process. Yeah, and I, I guess I guess a question to that, Leanne, through all the markets you deal with, inventory available uh, today or a month, I mean, it's easy to say it's in the hundreds of homes, right? Um, yeah. You know, Someone call you with the bid, ten million dollar, ten thirty one, and I'm sure you guys can facilitate that and facilitate it in, in a week. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid of that. We've got some teams that have some bulk. You know, we have small apartment deals, some you know bulk portfolios. Um, you know, we had a couple buyers in uh, actually with our Cleveland team that put two buyers. One of them put six properties under contract this past week, and one of them put five. They were little package deals of of properties. So we can we can get you in contact with with inventory for sure. Okay, uh, let's see. There's some 1031 exchange specific questions, guys. Again, we're gonna do, we're building some education here. We're gonna do a 1031 deep dive class. We're gonna bring in a CPA and a 1031 intermediary. So let's save those questions for those experts. Um, okay, let's do, uh, Let's do this one. Um, David asks, I bought a short-term rental property in 2022 that's losing money. If I sold it now, I would take a loss. Would you ever sell an asset at a loss to do the 1031 exchange? Well, so a couple of things. Firstly, you wouldn't need to do a 1031 if it's at a loss. The point of a 1031 is to avoid having to pay taxes on any gain. So good news, 
you don't need to do a 1031. Bad news, I'm sorry you're in that situation. I see a lot of people have bought short-term rentals the last couple of years, and I have two short-term rentals I've had for a decade, and I've seen the impact and reduction in revenue over the last two or three years, and it's because so many people jumped into it, right? Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, though, I would stop the bleeding, uh, honestly. Um, you know, so I guess the bigger question here is, hey, does it make sense to sell at a loss and then reinvest into a different asset instead of continuing the bleeding? And you know, talk to your CPA and your tax person and talk to your real wealth counselor. But um, I've had to make that decision once in my life on an investment I bought and it's real estate. And um, I did sell it at a loss, same as you, like a 20% loss on when I bought it, but I got out of it and I haven't looked back. Um, and I'm sure that's probably keeping you up at night a lot too, which isn't worth it. You don't invest in real estate um, to be stressed out over it. So I would say talk to your counselor, but I would consider getting rid of it, but you don't yeah. need a 1031. Yep. All right. This is a, a question um, and I'll, I'll par paraphrase. And I've had this conversation with so many investors, you know, the, the strategy of scaling and growing and getting like all these doors, like what is your philosophy or idea about like when enough is enough? Like, you know, is it just like to the moon? Like we're just acquiring until, you know, we can't no more. Or is there a point where it's like, okay, we've done it. We've done the hustle. Now we like reel it back in. Uh, I get asked a <laughs> question a lot in my life from all kinds of people. Uh, I think the answer is different for everyone, right? For me, it's never enough. Um, I don't like sleeping. I don't like resting. I like go, go, go and building. Um, you know, so I, I, I honestly, the, 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 the more I've spent, I guess rewinding a second, right? If you guys remember, I've been on the road for three months, right? I visited all my real estate. I've invested so many amazing markets and doing that makes me even more eager to invest more. And, uh, my whole brain's wrapped around how I can get more and more properties. And a lot of you like me for the first dozen properties I bought, I never visited them initially. No regrets. I still own them. It's been great. But I have been going out and visiting them and seeing the impact, you know, these new construction properties have made on the local community. And um, it's really, really, I think it really excited me. Um, it's easy to look at these investments on, you know, paper and forget that there is a home and there's a community there and there's a tenant and there are people. And, um, uh, you know, that's kind of rejuvenated me to want to actually expand uh, my portfolio. But I, I want hundreds of homes. There's no reason not to. If you develop a good system and you have a good structure, it's just a matter of scalability, uh, which real estate has. And it's just a matter of plugging into that scalable model and increasing it. So um, I think it's to that point, though, it's very important not to over leverage and find a balance. Right. I have a lot of investor clients that will maximize everything. They're at 75 percent leverage on the whole portfolio, always cash out refi, always 1031. But they've got half a million plus liquid in the bank because they know, hey, I'm operating at those extremes. I need to have a buffer. If you don't have half a million in the bank, do I say you take all the real estate you bought right now in 1031, all of it to max leverage and minimal cash flow? No, but if you can take a property that's making 150 a month and make 500 a month instead, like we did in some of these examples, you'd be foolish not to consider that. You know? Yeah, I think it's, that's well said. Um, Richard, if you advance to the next slide, let's get your contact information up here on the screen while we get through these next couple questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I just hearing you talk, I'm like, this is why we work with people like Richard. This is why you want a lender who who does what it is you're trying to do because, um, you know, while he's not giving you financial advice necessarily, he is able to kind of help you reason through some of the decision making process and and um, look at some of the the math objectively um, when it comes to to choosing loans and locking rates and everything. He's going to think about it like you like you should or like you do think about it. Okay, um, are your HELOC loans typically variable interest rates? Uh, our HELOCs uh, actually are fixed interest rates. Um, most of what you'll find in the market are variable rates, um, but what we offer here are fixed rates. Um, I'm almost, I almost like variable rates better uh, because they're going to go down with the market, obviously. Um, and also on that note, you know, we offer equity lines, uh, on, as, as Leah alluded to, on primary homes and rentals. Um, for primary homes, typically the best terms that you will get are at a local credit union. Um, I do let all my clients know that. You look, getting you guys the best product uh, for you to be able to invest in the best rates is part of my job. But, uh, whether that means you do business with me or not. Uh, we're happy to do all your equity lines, um, but
But for, if it is for a primary home, typically credit unions beat the big lenders and the big banks by one to one and a half percent. So definitely explore that as well, in addition to giving us the opportunity. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, this is a quick one, and I can take this one, um, Richard. Jeff asks, how much are the fees for the 1031 exchange intermediary services? Uh, they're, it depends on which intermediary you choose, but um, they're pretty reasonable. We have actually a resource menu on the Realty Portal, so if you're logged in, hover over resources at the top, and you'll see the 1031 exchange facilitators we recommend. Uh, there's two there. Um, and one does a flat a flat fee. Um, I think it's you know somewhere around fifteen hundred bucks plus or minus a hundred dollars here or there. I mean it's it's very very reasonable. Okay, David says you mentioned at the start of the webinar stocks versus rental property comparison. Did you do a fifteen year comparison between your best case real estate versus the S and P index fund? No, I didn't. I mean, the the numbers I pulled up there were from, I think it was Kate Schiller that did that as well, but from uh, the numbers that an, actually an economist ran versus me running the numbers. Um, but I haven't. But based on that same logic, if we're looking at, if you take an average return for real estate versus the average return for the stock market, once you factor in leverage, real estate is always going to be higher. Unless you're buying stocks with leverage, which most people aren't, right? If you're going to buy 100 shares of Apple, you need the money to do that. Um, you're not buying it with 20% down, right? And that is always going to be a differentiating factor between real estate and um, stocks. But personally, I like something I can touch and smell and breathe and, and you know, we're, and I have a stock portfolio. Don't get me wrong. I've done very well in it. But um, to me, hands down, I'm more of a tangible person. And, and plus, you know, the returns are going to be better. We are dealing with a finite resource land and we're all living longer and longer. So... Yeah, it's a slower moving asset too. The transaction costs are higher. I mean, that's something else to consider. Getting in and out of real estate True. is costly. Getting in and out of stocks, not not so much. So there's definitely some factors to consider. But I think if, if you're looking at, typically most deals are are doing you know easily when you look at all the different ways that it pays you easily 20% <laughs> return year over year. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't. Plus, I, I don't like the. To be frank, I like the forced piggy bank aspect too, right? Look, I love cars. I love to race. I love to do things. Um, it's easy to, it's not easy. And I don't recommend selling stocks to do silly things with, but you know, it's easier to access and, and, and liquidate a stock when it is, for example, some real estate, you know? So, you know, I like real estate because it's, you know, you buy it, you don't touch it, you know, and it, it, it generates wealth for you, right? It's a little soldier that's going to increase cash flow and, and build wealth. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Richard, I am so grateful that you took the time to really break this down for us and, and give us a look into your portfolio and your decision making process. I know we're way over the hour and you're at a rest stop, so we need to let you get back on the road uh, to your next place. But I, I want to give you kind of an opportunity to share some final wisdom or some parting thoughts to encourage people who are maybe on the fence about or, or holding on to that asset that they should probably be considering one of these strategies for. Absolutely. And I think I, I'll hit something even broader level, which is a lot of people are waiting for interest rates to drop before they take action, whether it's for a primary home or an investment property. Um, you can Google this. Fannie Mae releases their housing forecast every month, um, and they talk about all kinds of different data points in addition to their economist's projection of where interest rates will be. And it's interesting, through the end of 2025, they project primary home interest rates to be at 6.2%. Right. They're a little under they're in the high sixes today. That's not a big drop. Right. That's half a percent from where we are today. And that's through the end of 2025. So, you know, if you've been waiting for rates to drop or you've been saying it's not the right time, things aren't going to get dramatically better in terms of interest rates in the short term. Are we ever going to even get back to the you know, I've got a two and a half percent on my primary home. I, I probably never get back there. Hopefully we will. It was great time to be in the mortgage industry. But, you know, even three or four years from now, if we get to a point where rates are five, five and a half again, that's a healthy amount. And that's where, you know, that was considered an exceptional interest rate before. So, you know, broadly, the first thing I'll say is start looking at deals again if you're not, because rates are not getting a lot better. Um, a lot of sellers are providing incentives to bring the rates down as well. Um, but as it relates to what the topic of today, I think the big message is two is better than one or three is better than one, right? Participating in the growth of more assets is gonna make us more wealthy. Find the healthy balance 
to what works for you as an investor, right? Um, maybe it's taking four of your properties that are 50% loan to value to 65% loan to value, right? And that frees up enough money to buy two properties instead of leveraging to 75% across the board, right? Finding um, the right strategy for you is important, but I think what I've realized is reevaluating the strategy of what you've already been on is extremely important. And I haven't done that hiding behind while well, I'm a conservative, conservative investor. Well, that's made me blind even relooking at these. And now that I have, I'm like, ah, oh, man, okay, maybe I should have, <laughs> you know, done some of this before. Um, and, and it's not that I've lost anything from it. It's just, there's so much I could have gained until now. And I know I'm going to conservatively look at my whole portfolio now and look at trying to get more assets and participate in the growth of more real estate without having to put more money out of my pocket. Yeah. Awesome. So well said, Richard. Thank you so much for being such a great lending resource for us. Again, a reminder, Richard's licensed in all the different states where we have real wealth property teams. He can help you with any of the, the loans that we discussed today. So uh, definitely reach out to Richard. We've got his contact information up on the Realty Portal. We'll get the replay of this uh, webinar up on his page by tomorrow as well. So if you join late, you can uh, catch the full the full webinar there. Richard, thanks again. Really appreciate it. We'll have you back again soon, okay? Thank you very much, guys. All right, take care.